So wireless security algorithms are used to encrypt the data that is transmitted. <clears throat> the first of these is the Wired Equivalence, Equivalent Privacy, WEP, which was found to have major vulnerabilities as early as 1999. <clears throat> An attacker can now capture password data using freely available cracking tools. They can do it in just seconds. Wi-Fi Protected Access was the successor to WEP and is more secure, but is still vulnerable to dictionary attacks and the Temporal Key Integrity Protocol has a known vulnerability. So therefore, WPA2 was developed, and it's the successor to WPA, and is still thought of as being very secure, but it does have some flaws. However, it uses a stronger AES encryption, which often requires new hardware, and some libraries or organizations can't afford this type of hardware. So, Many people configure their wireless access points um, different ways. Often, there is no encryption protocol at all protecting it. And there's a study in 2012 that found that 22% of the access points that they looked at uh, weren't secured at all. Um, I did a search using Weigel, the wireless geographic logging engine, just the other day and found that 14% are completely unsecured, they don't use any encryption. And in 2006, which is seven years after the first WP vulnerability was discovered, there were still 85% of wireless access points were still using WEP. Um, and today it's still being used, um, which is cited in 2011, but then also more recent surveys. Um, there's different statistics on this, um, but it's somewhere around 20%. 13% uh, were found in 2012, 38 in 2013, 25. 2013, and then the study that I, or the uh, <clears throat> survey I looked at yesterday um, was 19%. And here's a table looking at the different, um, the succession of the different trends. So we see that there is a decrease in wireless access points that use no encryption. So in 2008, there were about 32%, and nowadays um, there's 0 to 14.8%, depending upon the survey you're looking at. Um, WP, WEP use is going down. Um, it was very widespread in 2006 and now it's, it's fairly rare. Uh, WP, WPA use has gone down a little bit in recent years, but it's being transitioned to WPA2, which is clearly um, being used more and more frequently, up from 5% in 2009 to almost 40% today. And this is a graphic from Weigel that uh, I downloaded. It just is a nice um, visual uh, representation of those statistics. So you can see here that the red is the no encryption and it's steadily declining. Um, the WEP is this little green uh, mound that is also declining, whereas WEPA2 and WEPA have been increasing over the last few years. So obviously libraries that use WPA2 will be best prepared, but WPA2 and WPA are not widespread. Um, there's still many networks that don't use either of those more secure protocols. However, even in libraries that use WPA2, those do not protect against certain man-in-the-middle attacks which can bypass the security that the standards offer. So in a man-in-the-middle attack, an attacker gets between the victim and the internet, or, or to who they're sending their information to. So the man-in-the-middle can intercept packets sent from the victim's computer, and they can also send packets that appear to come from the victim's computer. And this can be done in several ways, but two typical ways are in a phishing attack, where the attacker masquerades as a wireless access point. They use a clever SSID or network name that is very similar to what the legitimate network name is. Um, and I list a little example here where my library where I work, it's called Redwood's Library, but someone could set one up that looks like, that looks similar by calling it CR Redwoods. And then the attacker just waits for a victim to connect to CR Redwoods, which is actually their own computer. The second type of man-in-the-middle attack is when the attacker uses a denial-of-service attack to flood the wireless access point and force the victim's computer to lose the connection just momentarily and then their computer automatically tries to reconnect and the attacker masquerades as 
and wireless access point with using the exact same SSID as what the library is using. So they would use the same SSID and they would be able to do that because they caused the, uh, the legitimate wireless access point to crash. And then the victim's computer automatically connects to the attacker's computer without the victim even knowing anything has happened. <clears throat> So with all these threats, all these vulnerabilities, what should the patron do to secure their information? <clears throat> it's a pretty good idea to behave as though there is no security provided by the wireless access point. There may not be, but it's also just wise to be overly cautious. Another tip is to ensure that you're connecting to the actual trusted network. Make sure that you're not falling for one of those phishing attacks. Um, you can talk to the staff to make sure that it's, you're connecting to the right name. Um, it's a good idea for libraries to post the correct name of the network um, so that users know what to look for. And then <clears throat> finally, which is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this presentation, is end-to-end -end encryption. So the user can encrypt the data before transmitting it, and then any interception will need to be able to decrypt that data for it to be useful. So there are a few different kinds of end-to-end -end encryption tools, but one of the more popular is the PGP or Open PGP standard. Um, and there are several different types of software that use this, um, but I will just refer to that as PGP in this presentation. So it utilizes asymmetric key encryption, so public and private keys, <clears throat> and employs very strong encryption. It's considered to be military grade. However, these kind of uh, asymmetric encryption tools are very complex and there are a number of usability issues that have been cited in the literature. One of the things that users can do um, to compromise the security of this type of encryption is send unencrypted mail thinking that it's actually encrypted. Some of the programs are so um, so transparent that, they, that it's hard to tell when an email is or isn't encrypted. Another issue is key management. Some users have been found to be unable to send public keys or find public keys of the people they're trying to send information to. And then finally, the signing of keys is an important part of the process and many users don't understand what makes a valid key and they end up accepting keys that are not necessarily valid and they also don't learn how to verify keys and the importance of verifying keys. S-MIME is another program, which is a similar asymmetric encryption. Um, and it has similar usability issues, but it uses a certificate instead of, um, <clears throat> or not instead of, but in addition to the key management system. And it makes it a little bit easier to use than the um, public key exchange of PGP. Now there are also uh, a lot of integrated email programs that use SMIME and they offer enhanced usability features. Um, but again, it's, it's not intuitive and so there are still some serious usability issues. And in this case with SMIME, um, one of the major hurdles is that is the certificate itself. Though once it's set up, it makes things easier. It is difficult to set it up and it is difficult to understand the importance of the process of setting it up properly. Um, and then one of the other issues that was found is that some email programs don't react well to the certificates, the SMIME certificates, and give incorrect error messages, which can confuse users. So some of the considerations when using these tools is that key management does seem to be a major factor in blocking the widespread use of end-to-end -end encryption programs and that when you're using these systems, you need to make sure that you have proper training so that you can avoid simple but major mistakes. So encrypting email requires more education and, less is, and is less effective, and less, or less efficient rather. And so it uses up more user time and computing power. And so for the, these reasons, a lot of the time, these, this type of encryption is not being adopted. However, there are constantly new systems are being developed, and I list one here, which is called SafeSlinger, and it's a program <clears throat> that is a key management system targeted to smartphone users who can exchange keys in person and verify them in person and sign them. Uh, it's a very 
intuitive way for people to do it, hopefully. Um, and there's other programs as well. That's just one that I chose to show in this presentation. Um, another consideration is that end-to-end -end encryption does not secure the metadata. So the subject line of the email is visible. The time that the packet was sent can be seen um, by anybody snooping. The size of the packet and the destination of the packet are all, all can be seen. And these are concerns in modern uh, issues with the government snooping, the NSA and the FBI uh, revelations recently, and then GCHQ. Um, <clears throat> so this is an issue that I'm sure a lot of users will be concerned about. And so they would want to adopt a further security to mask the metadata. Um, and of course, end-to-end -end encryption is not a silver bullet. A multi-layered security approach is still required for any communication to be secure. So the connection is one of the more major concerns, but it is not the only concern. And that's important to keep in mind. So with these man-in-the-middle attacks uh, that I mentioned before, there are also some that can affect the exchange of keys. Um, these can be mitigated by using proper key exchange protocols like Diffie-Hellman or using a key signing party, which is where you're exchanging the keys in person. Um, but it's really important that users understand the importance of key signing and the proper procedures to do so. Uh, furthermore, a man-in-the-middle attack could easily be used when a third party, when the attacker gets the someone's private key. It's, it'd be very easy for a bad guy to just steal uh, Bob's private key and send a message to Alice and she would have no idea uh, that he was doing so. And so Bob needs to make sure that he has that secure. And then finally, uh, in programs that use third-party certificates like S-MIME, uh, the user is really relying on the trustworthiness of that third party and their security system, and then also their ethical integrity, especially in light of the NSA revelations.